Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for the kind invitation, Jay. And to all of you for making it here this, this afternoon. I'm going to talk about how to communicate science. And I guess there's going to be two big parts to this talk. One is going to be about some of the new ways in which we communicate as scientists. And one will be about what I think the existential question facing scientists who communicate in the public domain is going forward, which is this. Fewer Americans now say science has had a mostly positive effect on society. The pandemic, I think, has unearthed the very sobering fact that trust in science and scientists is plummeting. Routine childhood immunization is plummeting. And I think if we do not come to terms with the root reasons why trust in science is plummeting, we will have failed in our core responsibility as scientists, which is the communication of scientific ideas to the public. So part of the talk will be trying to get to the root of this which I think the last few years have laid bare. The first part of the talk, I think, is science is increasingly communicated in diverse places. And I think the way we communicate science has undergone rapid change, and in the next 10 years is going to be very different than the way it's done today. And I'm going to walk you through some of the new, for, some of the new avenues for communication. All right, to me, the number one thing that's coming along that's going to change things is preprint servers. Now, some of you may know that for a long time in biomedicine, we have sought the use of preprint servers, which is basically a website that serves as a repository for publications that have not yet gone through traditional peer review processes. And pre-COVID-19 pandemic, there had been a long-standing interest in doing this for biomedicine, but there were lots of reasons people gave as to why we can't do it. One reason was we worried that if you posted it on a preprint server, some journals wouldn't consider that. Number two, <laughs> Some of our science was done and it wasn't that important to get out right away, so we thought we could just wait for journal review processes. But when the pandemic hit, I think there was a nice confluence of events, which was the BMJ and the Med RxIV team at Yale University had just launched their server, and we suddenly had an opportunity where the results of scientific practices needed to be seen and understood by a huge amount of people in a very short time. And so because of the timing, because of the nature of the pandemic, we've had an explosion, explosion in preprints. So now when I publish an article for many of our articles, the first place we post it is on the server. I still think it's not perfect because if you have a commentary, an editorial, uh, uh, a review article, the server does not accept that. They only accept the original research articles, but I don't think it will be that long before even editorials and comments and viewpoints are also appearing on preprint servers. And I think that's part of how the game will be different. And here's the other part, Substack. Substack, of course, is a platform that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, there are a number of journalists who have taken their content and moved it to Substack. The difference between Substack and traditional journalistic outlets like the New York Times is anyone can make one. It's a newsletter you make and distribute to an audience that you create. You can find your audience through other social media websites. You can build up a following. And some subset of your audience can be a paid subscriber, which will generate revenue for the journalists. All of the journalists who have migrated to Substack including Matt Taibbi, including uh, uh, Matt Iglesias and Barry Weiss, have, I think, seen huge explosions in revenue and have even built businesses around the Substack model, a subscription-based news service. I think most notably, the free press by Barry Weiss is probably leading the charge in terms of size and scope. I think it has something like half a million subscribers. And the reason I think preprints and Substack go together is what is the real goal of a scientist? To some degree, we want our papers for academic recognition, but we also want our papers to disseminate the idea to a lot of people as quickly as possible. If you post a preprint, your preprint will only gain traction if the idea is a topic that lots of people care about, like the pandemic policy, or you're somebody who can tweet it or post it on LinkedIn or social media. But if you pair an article with sort of a short, quick, concise summary on Substack, I think you are going to see readership that is pretty close to what the best medical journals get. And I think we also have to keep in mind that a few medical journals get a lot of eyeballs, and a lot of medical journals get very few people reading it. So these are some substacks we run. We run one called Sensible Medicine. It's run by a group of five or six different doctors with different points of view, and we take guest editorials. And I guess this was a screenshot I grabbed. We happened to have a book review uh, by, by Paul, who is a hospitalist at Cornell, about Peter Tia's book, Outlive. Uh, but sometimes we talk about uh, the latest cardiology trials, or we talk about some controversial issue in medicine, and we have, I think, a subscriber base that is not dissimilar from the top medical journals in terms of size. I run another one called the Drug Development Letter where I talk about cancer drug policy. So all four people in this room interested in that topic can check that out, you know? And uh, I have my own called uh, My Observations and Thoughts. 
So I do think that if you pair preprints with Substack and other ways to disseminate it with more simplified uh, summary of the product, I think this will be the greatest threat journals face. I think journals have underestimated the role that these two platforms will have. For junior people, I think it will still be the currency to publish in JAMA, New England Journal, Nature, if you can. I think even for faculty. But at some point, I think if you make the submission process very easy to a preprint server, and if you know you can write a short summary of that article and get it to a lot of people in your field, I think many people will feel like it's not worth it to submit to the seventh journal, particularly if that journal is lower impact factor. So I think this is something that the journals need to think about if they want to stay relevant going forward. I also think the speed of this is going to eclipse journals. I mean, even the fastest journal submission is still on the order of many months. Scientists communicate on Twitter. You know, we've used Twitter, I use it personally, particularly to, you know, explain articles we've written. This article is called Multiplicity. When many analytic plans are applied and many redundant studies are run, false positive results are ensured. That's a study, that's a paper that I think, had I not tweeted it, nobody would have read it. But now I think quite a few people have read that paper and found it interesting. We also have users like Aaron Goodman. He is an old-fashioned hematologist based at the University of California, San Diego, and he walks you through just the bread and butter of medicine. You know, short, quick, high-yield summaries of, you know, uh, of, of hematology. Well annotated, visually nice, and I think these generate a lot of interest. So I think this is gonna be used as a teaching tool as well. YouTube. I think YouTube is an increasingly underutilized forum for scientists to communicate their information. I tell anybody, if you're going to make an oral presentation at a conference, record yourself giving it to your own home institution as a practice and put the video on YouTube. Why should conferences have these horrific paywalls to watch the results of research when we can post all those videos on YouTube and at least it'll be broadly available to anyone? Without, and I think in some cases, even people who have access to the conference will prefer to watch it in a way where you don't have to put in two-factor authentication and your password 20 times. YouTube reaches a wide audience. Uh, it is an audience that I think many people think it's a younger audience. I think that's true. Uh, less technical jargon. Uh, but it is the third most visited, face site, visited website after Google and Facebook. Finally, podcasts. I think podcasts, you know, I got interested in this maybe about five years ago. I think podcasts have revolutionized the content and conduct of disseminating science. Maybe five or, ten, five or six years ago, there was no podcast in most of your fields. I don't know where, what your background is, but now I think no matter what your field is, you can find a relevant podcast. Actually, let me pause and take a show of hands. Who here is a student, uh, a student in one of the schools here? Okay, who here is in residency fe or fellowship? Okay, who here is a postdoc? Okay, who here works in clinical medicine? Seeing patients, and who here does research? In, okay, okay, all right, so quite a mix. And who here is an oncologist? Ah, oh, one person, all right, take it. We got you covered. Pembrolism ab for everyone in the room. Podcasts, I think, don't require visual attention. They allow listeners to stay up to date on scientific dialogue. They make discussions that previously were only given in small group settings available to larger groups. And I think that they play an important role. And I, probably in all of your fields, there's a podcast that's coming along. And if not, you can start one. And you will quickly find that if you're the first one, you'll have the founder effect and you'll get quite a lot of followers on that basis alone. That was how I lucked into it because I think I was the first person to really pursue it in oncology. All right, a few more. <clears throat> Google Scholar. You know, I think Google Scholar is a much better way to disseminate your publications and keep track of your CV. You can even export it as a CV. Um, it's particularly good for people with common names in which there's a lot of confusion on PubMed. I know PubMed gives you an option to create my library, my publication library, but I think that's suboptimal. LinkedIn, I think, is extremely popular in Europe, and you can put summaries of your articles on LinkedIn, just as you would on Twitter or Facebook. It's a timeline of your job history. You can add a short bio and link it to other publications and websites. So I think that's another great option. And those are what I think are the ways in which science is going to be different going forward. It's not going to be as much lectures. It's not going to be as much reading journal articles. It's going to be a lot of these new social media tools and platforms. And the moment somebody finds a way to link preprints to sort of a substack dissemination and link it to some way in which you can attach commentary and criticism, I think you'll have a very powerful tool in which scientists prefer to communicate with. 
because I think the traditional journal publication model, many of us find extremely frustrating. We donate a lot of our time. We donate a lot of our effort. We get nearly no, nothing in return other than a line for your CV. And the companies that run journals are making hand over fist profits, 40% profit on revenue, making oil and natural gas companies look like they're not doing good. You know, the, these companies make so much money, it dwarfs even pharmaceutical industry in terms of profit on revenue, like Elsevier Saunders. All right, now the next part of the talk, maybe the more fun part, maybe the part you're really here for. Americans' trust in scientists and positive views of science continue to decline. And this is actually true across the political spectrum. It's true from young people, it's old people. We have a complete cratering of trust in science. And if I were to articulate what I think the root reason why is, is that we have not always been unflinchingly and unyieldingly honest about what we know about science, about our current policy recommendations. We have tried to browbeat people and pressure people into believing that what the quote unquote experts say is correct, but we have not had many honest debates about important scientific topics. We continue to exaggerate and distort the results of science. And to me, this is the greatest reason why there's loss of trust because more and more people can see what we're doing. They can see we're making these distortions. So I'm gonna run through some of these examples. We're gonna talk about cancer breakthroughs. We're gonna talk about the current CDC recommendation for home COVID-19 testing. We're gonna talk about Paxlovid, which has made $10 billion in this country and the evidence base for the continued use of the product. We're gonna talk about the current fall booster that was launched this year without any clinical trials. And then we talk about the biggest error of all, which I think has led to persistent debates and antagonism. Or you can stop me at any time we can do questions. So a few years ago, 2016, I was looking through the brochures about cancer and I saw this article. I saw this figure. This was put forth by the MD Anderson and they were advertising what you might expect if you go to MD Anderson. Remember, their slogan is making cancer history. They put a, they put a line through history. You know, they put a line through cancer to say it's gone already. That's their slogan. And they have a new clinic for personalized cancer medicine and this is what they offer patients in 2016. They say, you know, imagine you come in with cancer. You're one of these 12 people there over on the left. We're gonna not treat you based on where your tumor comes from. We're not gonna treat your kidney cancer, your prostate cancer. We're gonna take your tumor and perform full molecular profiling. Maybe we're gonna do sequencing for you know, 300 gene mutations like foundation medicine. Maybe we're gonna do more molecular profiling. We're gonna look at the proteome. We're gonna look at you know, all sorts of things in the cell. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna realize that sometimes mutations are present across tumor types. So like that red person in the upper left, the red person in the middle, and the red person on the bottom, that might be somebody with colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. And, but they all have a mutation in, let's say, BRAF, V600E. And then on the right, you see what happens after all this process. You get the purple pill, the blue pill, the red pill. You get personalized cancer treatment. And this is their advertisement. And my problem with the advertisement is not that it's wrong in terms of the message or in terms of its uh, uh, idea. It's that it's wrong completely in terms of the actual numbers because the year they put it out, the year before, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, they published their own, their own results of what happened when they applied molecular profiling to 100 consecutive patients who came into their clinic. So I have corrected the figure for what the real result is. Only 6.4% of people could be paired with the drug at all after the molecular profiling. So what am I to think when a cancer center puts out this image and the reality is this image? I think they tell two different stories. Of course, I made this in Photoshop, you know. Um, that to me is a way in which science, I think, misses the mark, a way in which we exaggerate what, we, what we're doing and give people a false idea. A few years ago, I had a debate at ASCO where we talked about the difference between practice, uh, sorry, we talked, about the, we talked about the use of genomic therapy in cancer medicine. And the argument was, is genomic therapy in cancer medicine mostly hope or mostly hype? And in preparation for that debate, which I was debating the side it's mostly hype, we performed an analysis of all FDA approved genomic drugs at the time. And what we did was very simple. We asked ourselves, if you were one of the 600,000 Americans who presented to the doctor with advanced or metastatic cancer, how many of those people would be currently eligible for genomically targeted drugs based on mutations that they had, based on FDA approved drugs? That was our question. So I'm debating, is it mostly hope, mostly hype? I wanna just quantify. What percent of the next 100 people who walk into this hospital with cancer will get a genomic drug, okay? And then I wanted to do it year by year. And I wanted to do it year by year to show you whether or not it's getting better over time. Is it going up and up and up, or is it stagnating, okay? 
And in the next figure, I'm gonna show you what we published in JAM Oncology. This is year by year, the uptake, the, the percent of cancer patients eligible for genomic drugs. And here it is. The blue line shows you the percent up, the percent eligible. I think at the time of our study, it was like 10.2%. We published a follow-up paper, it's like 11.2%. Uh, one of the things people had talked about is that it was undergoing exponential growth. There's no such thing. That there's an inflection point. No such thing. It's a slow and steady 1% to 2% upward trudge. There's progress in cancer for sure, but it's, you know, slow. It's hard fought. Advertisements. All right. I was reading the cancer brochure and I saw this ad and it was for a drug that's near and dear to my heart, a drug that I actually don't like to give that often. It's called Affinitur. And it's the final overall survival results from Radiant 3. And here it is, it looks nice. They've taken the liberty of highlighting in those positive results so you can't miss it. And here in the positive study, you see right there, I was like, oh, I didn't know. Actually, I had been following this really closely. I hadn't heard that the Radiant 3 trial had a survival benefit of 6.3 months. But then I read the fine print, and here's what it said, that the results shown here are not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful, not statistically significant. And I thought to myself, I'm pretty sure that's a deceptive ad, okay? It's not, it's actually a negative study. <laughs> They've just colored it in nicely. We hear all the time that cancer drugs are miracles, revolutions, game changers, and cures. And for a long time in my clinic, or not my clinic, a long time in lung cancer clinic, which I used to attend in, I heard the following. When a patient came in with lung cancer, we would perform genomic sequencing. And if they had an ALK mutation or an EGFR mutation or a ROS1 mutation, we would say, good news. Good news, they have a mutation for which we have a drug. And the reason we said good news was because of this. If you look at the, if you look at the average duration, this is called cumulative median duration of response, but a, uh, Simpler way to think about it is the, the amount of time after the diagnosis of cancer that someone is going to get drugs. So it's almost life expectancy, because unfortunately in cancer we give drugs almost to the end of life, but it's a little bit shy of life expectancy, okay? It's a different concept. Cumulative duration of therapy, you can just think about how long you've got. On the top, this is lung cancer that is typically smoking driven, PD-1, pd one stain, and you get you know about a year, year and a half, you know? And then these are all the mutations somebody might have. You might have HER2 or NTREC or BRAF and RET, and that's how long you'll, get, you'll be on the drugs if you have one of those mutations. And so this is why people say, hey, it's good news. Somebody lives six years if they have ROS1 mutations. But the moment I heard this, I had difficulty reconciling it with my clinical experience. Because in my clinical experience, I always feel profound sadness when I see patients at the bottom of this table. Because they're not like... I mean, I feel sadness for anybody dying of lung cancer, but especially sadness for this because I'm often seeing a 40-year-old woman who's coming to clinic with three young children and she's dying of metastatic lung cancer and she is never a smoker, or a 50-year-old guy. Whereas in the top, I often see people 75, 80, 65. And I thought to myself, this figure does not capture the median age with which you get the diagnosis. And so we published in the journal Cancer Medicine this plot. Here I show you for all of the types of lung cancer we have based on treatment, the blue bar and the green bar shows you the median age with which someone was diagnosed with that disease. The orange bar shows you the cumulative treatment benefit. So everybody in my field is talking about how big those orange bars are on top, but what they're missing is just how many years of life are lost because these geno genomic cancers are affecting people 10 or 15 years before a cancer caused by a lifetime of smoking. You know, so for me to hear ALK drugs are game changers and it's good news when that's how many years of life are lost still, I think is profoundly disappointing, profoundly inaccurate, and fails to capture the experience of the clinic. And that's what we hear in cancer medicine all the time. You go to the conference and then you actually go to the clinics and the wards and it's two different stories. It's a story of dazzling success that comes out every year and the reality is that some of us have to be there at the bedside of a 40-year-old woman and then tell the three kids that they're not gonna have a mother anymore, you know? So this is the reality. So I think we're patting ourselves on the back way too soon, and there's a lot more we need to do to improve the outcomes in this disease. <clears throat> All right, now let's get a little bit more exciting. 
We're dishonest about testing. The current CDC policy about COVID-19 testing is absolutely inappropriate and off the mark, and it's really just a giveaway of taxpayer money to the manufacturers of these testing ki kits. And let me show you why. Number one, Denmark. Current Denmark policy says who should test for COVID-19? Imagine you feel sick this winter, sore throat, runny nose. This is what Denmark says about COVID-19 testing. Quote, testing is no longer recommended for the majority of the population. Public testing was closed in April. They only recommend it for if you are at risk, a high risk of severe illness. And they recommend it only for those people because they're thinking about maybe you take a Paxlovid. We'll come back to that. Norway, should I take a COVID-19 test if I feel sick this winter? Quote, you do not need to test for COVID-19, even if you have symptoms, unless you're in the high risk group. And that's because, again, Paxlovid might be appropriate. We'll come back to that. The U.S. policy currently on their website, when to take a COVID-19 test immediately. All ages, everybody. Test, test, test. And if you don't have a test, we're going to spend $600 million to the billions we've already spent and mail one to you. And if you test positive, you got to stay at home for five days. This is CDC guidance right on their website as of today. All right. So let's think about two worlds. My recommendation, my recommendation, I'm an old fashioned doctor. If you feel sick, stay home. If you feel good, go to work. I don't think anyone needs to test. I even think the high risk people don't need to test. I'll show you why in a second. My recommendation, I think, is much closer to Western Europe. The CDC recommendation in this country is everyone should test themselves if they feel any tickle in their throat. Let's think about the implications of the two policies. Here, I imagine two worlds, okay? Every, pick, every person shown here, I think, represents roughly two people. Uh, sorry, uh, if, you, if you scale this to 100%. Actually, you don't have to, I mean, okay. They represent one person. This is about, okay, so basically what I'm showing you here. In my world, where with, without universal testing, where people who feel sick stay home, based on current CDC, current CDC numbers, at any given time in a winter season, maybe 8% of people will feel some upper respiratory tract infection. I would advise these people to stay home when you feel sick and go back to work when you feel better. And of those people, about 10% will be positive for COVID-19. In the CDC's recommendation, you would apply a test to this box of people and you would tell these three people, hey, you don't have COVID-19, you have a negative COVID-19 rapid test. And this person might be told, you're yellow, you have COVID-19. In my world, you don't know what you got. You just feel sick, stay home until you feel better. Their world, you're testing these people. I think if we want to ask ourselves, is testing sound policy, we have to ask ourselves, what do people do with the result of this information? In my world, without testing, all these people, now I've scaled it up to 100, all these people, one of 10, will have COVID-19. This is, let's say, a hypothetical 8% of population. They feel sick. One person stays home seven days, and the other people stay home when they feel sick. Okay? I pick seven days here because that's the median duration of symptoms currently. With testing, this one person stays home for five days. Okay, it's actually a little bit shorter in the CDC's policy. What do these nine people do? What do they do? A student showed up in my lab hacking and coughing with a surgical mask on. I asked if she's sick. She says, yes, that's why I'm wearing the mask. I told her next time you feel sick, you should stay home. This is what a doctor texted, texted me. I'm embarrassed to admit that I tested for COVID-19 because if I were negative, I had planned to wear a mask and go to clinic. And I think the problem with the current CDC guidance is other people may alter their behavior in ways you do not understand. By getting a negative COVID-19 test result, you may actually empower people with either a false negative COVID-19 test result, and we'll talk about that, or they have another respiratory virus, but they think it's better than COVID-19, and they may actually go out and spread it as a result of this information. We have no idea if the current effect of the CDC policy is more or less spread of all respiratory viruses in the winter season. And the only way to tell apart which world is better is actually a randomized controlled trial. You could do a cluster trial, you could do an individual trial, I won't berate that. But if you want to know, is the routine recommendation of testing improving respiratory viral spread in a population, you need to randomize people because you have to consider compensatory behavioral change that you may not anticipate. Oh, but now consider the test is not perfect. We've got a bigger problem. If you look at Cochrane guidance, currently rapid point of care testing, and you look at the pooled sensitivity and sensitivity in asymptomatic and asymptomatic people, it's 73, sorry, symptomatic people is 73%, asymptomatic people is 54%. So what does this mean? Here I imagine a hundred people right now who have COVID-19, okay? In the blue box are people who are asymptomatic who have COVID-19 right now. These are 100 hypothetical people with COVID-19. If you have a policy, the current CDC's policy, where you just test the sick people with 73% sensitivity, you will get all those yellow people, you'll catch them with COVID-19, you'll advise them to stay home. But all those black people outside of the box, they're gonna go around because they have a negative COVID-19 test. 
all the people in the blue box, they never took a test. They don't feel sick at all. So they're also gonna walk around spread COVID. On the right is a strategy where we test everybody every day with COVID-19. And what's my point here? My point here is that either of these two strategies, among 100 people with COVID-19, 56 are missed with a strategy of just testing sick people. 42 are missed with a strategy of testing sick and healthy people. Most people, no matter how much testing we deploy, will continue to walk around with COVID-19 unknowingly with a policy of test when sick or test everybody. This policy is not going to put a damper on transmission over winter season. I think it's fantastical thinking to believe so. Let's zoom back. Some people tell me that we gotta test everyone to like slow the spread, prevent the spread of variants. Let's think about the world. We have 8 billion people on this planet. There's 331 million people in America. That's 4% of the world's population. 7.6 billion people on this planet live in low and middle income countries. Those people cannot, will not, will never have rapid COVID-19 tests every day. That means 85% of the world's population is going to have unfettered spread of COVID-19. Testing is not going to do anything for those people. The average person on this planet has 12 interactions with other people per day. It means that each day there's 100 billion person-to-person -person interactions. Since the start of the pandemic, there's 100 trillion person-to-person -person interactions. And global testing for COVID-19 has at best tested 1 billion of 100 trillion interactions or 1 ten thousandth of the, sorry, 1 one hundred thousandth of all the interactions. What's my point here? My point here is that the spread of respiratory viruses is a forest fire. It's going to go around the world until there are no more human beings for it to consume. If you apply all the testing you want, it's like when the forest fire is coming in Lake Tahoe and I go in my backyard and I pour a glass of water on the lawn and I think it's not gonna get my house. It's just gonna get it a little bit later at best. It's not gonna do anything. Okay, that's my thought. I think I put another way, testing companies I think have made billions of dollars from these products. And I think that as a company, they have a moral and medical obligation to show under what circumstances the application of their test can improve outcomes. Just this year, Biden administration has given them another $600 million. COVID-19 test makers have made $4 billion since the pandemic began. And I think this space is riddled, I hate to say it, with conflicts of interest. The leading proponent at Harvard for why we need more rapid tests is now the chief medical officer of a company that makes COVID-19 tests. He's moved from Harvard. We have an incredible cash grab. And so what I would say is that if you're the manufacturer of the test, the government should put some pressure on you to say, show me under what circumstances the application of your test can actually improve outcomes. All right, so my overall problems with testing everyone, one is I think even if you tell them to do it, they're not gonna do it. So I think most people won't follow the advice. I didn't even model the non-adherence. I think the test has imperfect test characteristics. You'll miss most cases even if you test everybody. Um, you don't know how behavior has changed, if it's changed favorably. You don't know if what there is a Peltzman effect. And in the grand scheme, I made my forest fire analogy. Okay, let's come to the next part, Paxlovid. I think we have been pushing Paxlovid very aggressively in this country. And this, administra and this administration actually paid $5 billion before the results of Epic HR. I think we continue to be dishonest about the evidence base for Paxlovid, and that's been covered by Todd Lee and colleagues from McMaster in this, play in this piece in, e in evidence-based analysis. And I wrote a paper called Paxlovid, a Re Regulatory Gamble in the American Journal. And I'll just show you a few data points. One, this is from Financial Times. It shows the infection fatality rate of COVID-19 over time. And what you see is it's just been dropping, dropping, dropping uh, with the era of prior infection, boosters, Omicron, and it is in the ballpark of seasonal influenza currently. The next thing I'd say is the Epic SR study, the only study run by Pfizer to look at whether or not Paxlovid improves outcomes in people who have been vaccinated is a negative study. There is no difference in symptom resolution. The confidence interval is so big you can park a school bus in it. It is a negative study. All right, now here's a figure I made. There's two versions of it. One shows you the epidemic waves superimposed and one shows you the IFR over time and I've lined up all the dates. Here it shows you when alpha variant was circulating, when beta, delta, and Omicron were circulating. And here is every single trial randomized study of Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. And what is my point here? Number one, green means the studies were positive. The Molnupiravir study that was positive occurred in the era of delta. Now we have a study called Panoramic, whose sample size is massive. Tens of thousands of people run in the UK. And Molnupiravir is mostly negative in the current analysis. This is a negative randomized study shown in red. And I think most clinicians have moved away from molnupiravir. Panoramic is also being run for Paxlovid, but that study has had multiple extensions of sample size because they have not reached enough events. The study is, continues to be ongoing. This will be the definitive study, Panoramic. Epic HR was the original study that led to emergency use authorization. To be an Epic HR, you won 
could never have had COVID before, two, had to be at high risk of severe disease, and three, you had to have not had any vaccine doses, and four, you had to get mostly Delta. So this is a study of older, sick, unvaccinated people who are getting COVID for the first time during Delta, and we have applied that data to younger, healthier people who are triple boosted, and we have negative EPIC SR, which is the closer study, and we have this negative study, which has this clinical trials numbers run in China. Shown here is the seroprevalence over time. Seroprevalence goes up. My argument, as seroprevalence goes up, as variant becomes less lethal, the data looks more negative. And I think Panoramic is going to be a staggeringly negative study, and we we're going to have spent $15 billion, mostly on prescribing that was entirely inappropriate. Another way to look at this, these are the actual raw counts. This is Epic HR. Placebo versus Paxlovid, it's an 8% hospitalization being brought down dramatically. And these are what we see with uh, the Chinese study and Epic SR, the follow-up study in vaccinated people. You know, it's hard, the, the base rates are falling. They continue to fall. In Todd Lee's paper, he shows that the number needed to treat in Epic SR, if you believe, um, sorry, th that the number needed to treat from Epic HR would put, the, would put it at 212 for Omicron, which cost $112,000. I'll skip this part. I actually think it's going to be, my, my point here is just that even people who think it works know that it's going to be $150,000 to avert one hospitalization, which would not be considered cost effective in any nation. Here's what we get instead of randomized studies. This is a company that's making billions of dollars from the sale of this product, and they have not been asked to generate randomized studies to, I think, the satisfaction of most pre prescribing doctors. We don't know about young people, et cetera. We get instead these observational studies that support Paxlovid. This was one that came out of the Cleveland Clinic. It compares people in the Cleveland Clinic who came in sick. Some of them got Paxlovid and filled it, and some of them didn't get Paxlovid. And here are the results. The top is Paxlovid. The bottom is Molnupiravir. These benefits are huge. If you get Paxlovid, you are much less likely to be hospitalized or die than if you don't get Paxlovid. Okay, that's true for Paxlovid and Molnupiravir in observational data. What are some problems? One problem I note is that this molnupiravir data, actually we have a randomized control trial, panoramic, which is tens of thousands of people, the exact same population. The hazard ratio they get in this observational study is 0.37. The hazard ratio in the exact same population the randomized study, 1.06. Absolutely stone cold negative. Who gets these antivirals? People who are more affluent who are more likely to be well-connected, people who actually don't get hospitalized before you can fill the prescription. Let's talk about that. We wrote this paper in JAMA Internal Medicine. It's called Detecting Selection Bias in Observational Studies When Interventions Work Too Fast. Eric Topol put this graph up of whether or not Paxlovid protects you against long COVID. And there's something very interesting about the curves. When you zoom in, you often see this. What is going on here? These drugs work instantly. How does Paxlovid instantly prevent long COVID, instantly. And why can no one on Paxlovid experience the event of hospitalization? And the other curve looks the same, they all split instantly. Why can no one experience the event of hospitalization in the first three days? If you get placebo, if you're not placebo, there's no placebo control. If you don't get Paxlovid, you can be hospitalized day one, day two, day three, day four. If you get Paxlovid, no one's getting hospitalized for the first few days. Why is that? Because to be on the arm that gets Paxlovid, you could not have been hospitalized before you went to the pharmacy. And that's called guarantee time. Guarantee time is time that's insured to one group, but not the other group. Because to be in that Paxlovid arm, you had to go there and fill the prescription and put that pill in your mouth. And that guarantees you didn't go to the hospital right away. You at least stayed out long enough to get the script. And so these studies are plagued by two biases. One, residual confounding, and two, guarantee time. So to come back to this gentleman's point, we have given test makers billions of dollars in government handouts. Private insurers are paying billions for this. These companies have never shown testing improves outcomes in any context. More testing does not always improve outcomes in medicine. And I think paid sick leave is the solution because you don't want somebody to come in sick regardless of what. And so I think this administration has missed. They have paid for testing and they should have been pushing for paid sick leave. Okay, let's do the booster. I'm of the belief that most adults healthy middle-aged adults should not get the COVID-19 booster. The CDC disagrees. This is from their website today. Protect yourself and the ones you love this holiday season. Get your COVID-19 vaccine and annual flu shot. They recommend it for anyone six months and up, okay? Here's what I would say. I would say the US FDA has an obligation to demand randomized controlled trials for boosters 
powered and designed to assess clinical endpoints from these two companies, which have made over $100 billion from the sale of these products. And this wasn't always my position. This used to be the position of Peter Marks, who's the head of FDA. Here's what Peter Marks says. Peter Marks, last year, December 2022, JAMA, the urgent need for new COVID-19 vaccines. He's talking about this year's fall. Quote, although experience with the mRNA platform has enabled the authorization of multiple versions of vaccines without large clinical trials, when more significant modifications are made to a vaccine, the clinical effects are often unexpected. Biological properties that may have plausibly have beneficial effects often have unanticipated consequence. Therefore, unless correlates of protection that are strongly associated with the duration of protection can be identified, it is likely that rather than relying on immunobridging, which means antibody studies, to infer vaccine effectiveness, large randomized clinical trials similar to the initial trials of the currently authorized vaccines will be required to ascertain the effectiveness of the new vaccines. He said that a year ago, and he has, and the FDA, have completely rescinded that position as they moved into this fall's booster. Other nations do not recommend it to the majority of people. This is the NHS. It's only if you're 65 and up or if you are otherwise at high risk. This is Sweden, again, 65 and up. Italy, 60 and up. France, 60 and up. Germany, 60 and up. Denmark, 65 and up. Portugal, 60 and up. New Zealand, 65 and up. Okay, Anthony LaMesa writes, no country currently recommends COVID-19 immunization for healthy children, according to the European Centers for Disease Prevention and Control, the European CDC. This is strictly an American phenomenon. The US is once again a global outlier by persistently recommending the annual vaccination of children. And I think that's a problem for trust in science because you have to choose wisely, recommend the vaccines that are very necessary for children and not the ones that are heavily disputed and have frankly no evidence. This is the CDC's guidance. Anyone six months and up. If you look at every country, you find no other country recommends boosters for children. No other country recommends COVID-19 boosters for the entire population. There is once again no discrimination by having had prior COVID. Doesn't matter if I had COVID just this summer, I'm recommended to get the booster. Vaccine makers don't support the policy. This is Paul Offit. Paul Offit made the rotavirus vaccine. Offit writes, quote, or Offit says, He's a pediatrician in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is from the journal Science. He sits on the FDA's vaccine advisory board. He has strongly opposed the broad recommendation for boosters, says it makes less sense now. The second reason he says people are pushing boosters is long COVID. Doesn't it make any sense to give an additional dose to prevent your chance of having long COVID, fatigue, headache, brain fog, muscle aches, et cetera? And he asked, are there data to support that additional doses beyond what most people have already gotten? Because at this point, most people have gotten a few doses plus a natural infection, which is defined as hybrid immunity. And most of this country has that. Do, does an extra dose make a further difference? And the, fra the fact is, there's no evidence that that is the case. Offit, who is 72 and had three COVID-19 shots and COVID-19, did not receive last year's booster and will not receive this year's booster. I have hybrid immunity and clearly hybrid immunity is best. I think this booster policy has caused a lot of problems at FDA. This is from just a few years ago. Two top FDA vaccine regulators, Marion Gruber and Phil Krause, the director and deputy director of vaccine products, they resigned over the universal booster campaign that was launched a few years ago. They write, quote, we don't need universal booster shots. We need to reach the unvaccinated. This was two years ago. Now I think the unvaccinated have largely had and recovered from COVID-19. We, we might not need either anymore. We don't think boosters for all are necessary, even with the emergence of the Omicron variant, Gruber and Krauss write. This is Paul Sachs from the Brigham. Paul Sachs is the ID chief. He writes, this just came out last week in a 10 takeaways about COVID-19. There are no data showing additional vaccine doses are beneficial for healthy people who have hybrid immunity, and questions have been raised about the need for young people and children to get an annual booster, especially if they've had the virus previously. The American people don't want the annual booster. No one's got it. We got 4% in the youngest age group. We only have 23% in 65 and older. To be honest, it's by going after everybody, they may have actually missed the opportunity to push the boosters in nursing home patients, which I would guess would be the place that it might get the most bang for the buck if there is a place to get bang for the buck. The COVID-19 fall booster that they've approved does not even target fall COVID-19. The booster is approved for XBB 1.5 of SARS-CoV-19. It's a booster against XBB 1.5. This is the CDC's own now cast showing you the prevalence of the different COVID-19 strains. I'm gonna highlight XBB over time. This is gonna take it to the end of October. You're gonna watch which fraction is XBB. It's this fraction. It's not there anymore. We're targeting a strain of the virus that's no longer in circulation. So this booster misses the mark. A couple more things. 
we don't talk more about the randomized study. I think it's, a, it's the core question. Okay, so I think one thing is the CDC puts out data saying that there is still risk of COVID-19 hospitalization, and that's shown here in this figure by age group. But the problem is the CDC's method for tracking COVID-19 hospitalization uses, quote, you sample the cases that you think have COVID-19 hospitalization, and then you examine the admission history and physical examination or face sheet of the chart. You don't examine the full chart. You only examine admission h &P or face sheet. The problem with face sheet is face sheet has, for anyone who's a practicing clinician, face sheet has nearly no relevant information about what actually happened by the time somebody went to the unit. And so Branch Elliman and colleagues from Boston, they went through the COVID-19 hospitalization metric and they've tried a couple of times to provide alternative ways of capturing the real burden of disease from hospitalization. And their first metric is, let's not look at just people who have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test when they come to the unit or when they come to the floor, let's look at the percent of people who actually have demonstrable hypoxemia, and let's look at the percent of people who are actually getting dexamethasone, which was recommended by the recovery trial. And let's look at people who are fully vaccinated in those rates and people who are not fully vaccinated over time. And I think by all these metrics, you find there is overestimation in hospitalization if you look at just somebody who happens to be hospitalized who also has COVID-19 and not people who are hospitalized because of COVID-19. I work in the ICU. I've been on service last two weeks. I cannot remember the last time that there has been a patient who has ARDS from COVID-19. Everybody coming with COVID-19 in the unit, they're there for another reason. They're getting chemotherapy, they have colon cancer, and they happen to have a COVID-19 swab, and so we put them on precautions. It's not clear to me that COVID-19 is the reason why they're in the unit, but rather a bystander. There's one more method that they applied. Same, same researchers, they went through the charts at the VA system, and they had two readers code in parallel the full chart review seeing what happened day by day by day. And they looked at hundreds of charts, and this is basically the result. From January to February of 2020, they code whether or not somebody who's in the ICU who dies with a positive COVID-19 case, what percent of those are COVID-19 caused, COVID-19 contributed, or COVID-19 is non-contributory by the day after the positive test in which they died. So what you can see here is that, yeah, they think 60% of cases are caused by COVID-19 among people who die in the ICU, but as you get further out from that positive test, they think you're dying for a different reason. You just happen to be a bystander. Okay, that's what their analysis is saying. This is January 2022. Now go to August 2022. They apply the same method. And now they find the majority of COVID-19 deaths in the ICU are actually COVID-19 is not contributory. So to me, I'm not even sure when you tell a 72-year-old person who had two doses and prior COVID, what is your actual risk of getting COVID a, a, a second time and being hospitalized? We cannot even give them a number. Is it one in 10,000, one in 100,000, one in 50,000? And is it really the COVID-19 putting you in the hospital? I think there's market uncertainty in CDC's estimates. Can observational studies help? Let's look at the observational data. Again, I come back to my paper on things working too fast. This is the original fa Pfizer vaccine randomized control trial of the Pfizer vaccine. And it shows people who get the Pfizer shot to people who get placebo, okay? And as you can see, the curves split on, let's say, Day seven, day 10, it takes 10 days after vaccination to reduce the primary endpoint of this study, symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. You have symptoms and you swab positive for COVID-19. Meanwhile, from the Claritz study from Israel, this is a plot of death from COVID-19 comparing people who get two boosters to one booster, or in other words, four doses to three doses. Where does death from COVID-19 split after the booster? It splits. I would argue, way too fast. To die from COVID-19, the booster has to prevent you from getting COVID-19, and then COVID-19 has to go cause lung damage, you get hospitalized, you get on the vent. You should not be seeing the curve split before day 10, and yet you see that. What can be the only explanation for why the curve split so quickly? We found that out, this is our paper, New England Journal. We say that there is a healthy vaccine bias. The type of person who rushes out to get each additional dose is different than the person who doesn't go to get COVID-19 do additional doses. In fact, they're so different that they didn't have COVID-19 when they went out there. They're already being precautious. That's why the curve splits so fast that it's working because they already don't have COVID-19 before they even got the booster. These people are fundamentally different. How might you prove that, that they're different? All right, so they published a paper from the Israeli group. They said COVID-19 booster group has a 94% reduction in COVID-19 death from unboosted population, which is massive. In a subsequent letter, the same group reported the raw numbers of deaths related not to COVID-19 in both groups. So in the first paper, they only told you COVID-19 death. In the second subsequent letter, 
they accidentally told me death not from COVID-19. So we went back and we back calculated New England Journal mortality not related to COVID-19 in the two groups. And we found there's a 95% reduction in mortality not related to COVID-19 from boosters. How does a booster lower COVID, not COVID-19 deaths 95%? And the answer is only if the people who are getting them are healthier than the people who are not getting them. So these studies, I think, are profoundly, profoundly conflicted. Even if you postulate non-COVID-19 reductions, 95% reduction on COVID-19 death. That's the greatest medical product ever made in human, 95% reduction. It's a 95% reduction in all death. That's unbelievable. That's not even plausible. It's too, it's too big. It's basically, there'll be, nobody will be dying. We all get boosters, we'll live forever. You can look at other things. Here's what you can look at. Car accidents. I would hypothesize that the group that didn't get boosted has more car accidents. You could look at, and in fact, Donald Ruttemeyer showed that in one of his papers. So if they want us to believe this data, give me some falsification endpoints. Pick some endpoints you think are not related to COVID-19 boosting. COVID-19 boosters cannot lower your risk of car accidents. And then show me there's no reduction in car accident death. I suspect there are going to be huge differences because in Israel, people rushing to get boosters are different. And I think, I don't know about your data, but I suspect there may be some of the same problems in that data set comparing these two different groups of people because I think they're different at baseline too. Veterans? Who got, and the ones who happen to get COVID-19 and the ones precautious enough not to get them. I think there could be differences in the people, perhaps not the virus itself. So I would say that even using these methods, even using these methods, these flawed analytical methods, I think observational to justify perpetual boosting, this is the New England Journal's result of what boosting does for your probability of getting any infection. And the answer is, it, even a few weeks after a booster, it regresses to baseline levels. So when CDC says that an 18-year-old should get a booster to protect their grandma from getting COVID-19, I think they don't have the basis to say that. Because even a few weeks later, by their own metric, which has baked in selection bias, they don't have, it will dissipate. I think the thing we forget about boosters is that by getting a booster, you are unable to perform daily activities. This is from the CDC's own tracker for the current booster. 28% of people who get the booster report that they cannot perform daily activities for one day. Do we actually lose more days of healthy life by boosting everyone than we gain from averting COVID-19 infections? I think that's an open question because 28% of people miss one day on the couch or in bed. Now let me come to my final points. COVID-19 annual boosters are different than the flu, I think. Flu mutates more. The COVID-19 shot is more reactogenic. There are more days of work missed. Flu tries to predict future North American strains. The COVID-19 shot uses past or circulating North American strains. Flu does not have as steep an age gradient, so you could argue that there's more of a justification to go after younger groups. FDA officials did not resign over the flu shot. Flu shots could also have better RCT data, too. We're working on RCTs of different algorithms. If you alter spike, one of these days, you're gonna get more myocarditis. I mean, I think we know from Novavax and mRNA vaccines that it is the spike protein that is creating myocarditis because both mRNA and non-mRNA platforms have myocarditis. And every time you modify spike and you make the body make antibodies against spike, you will get, you will get myocarditis. Katie Scharf has shown that in young men, it's one in 10,000 from the third dose. That's from Kaiser Permanente. One of these times, we will have an annual, flu, we'll have an annual COVID-19 shot. We modify it, you'll get a lot more myocarditis. You might get less, you might get more. But I think that's a salient point as we continue to recommend young people get booster after booster. All right. So this is something that people say, and I have it in my other slide deck, but I think it is way higher from boosting in young men. So we had a paper, I presented this this morning in their small group, but we have a paper. It's in the European Journal of Clinical Investigation. And we look at people who wish to compare COVID-19 myocarditis from the virus from the vaccine. A few points. One, if you get as many doses of the vaccine you want, you'll still get COVID-19. Okay, so you're still running some risk of myocarditis from COVID-19. That's one. Two, myocarditis from post-vaccination appears to be lower from the virus than before. Three, I think it varies by age group. I will be perfectly clear. My point of view is that Older, uninfected Americans, if you were 60, if you were 80, if you were 50, and January of 2021, you had never had COVID-19, you have a huge personal health benefit from getting the vaccine in that quarter. The question is, if you're a 20-year-old man and you already got dose one of Pfizer and Moderna, should you get dose two on a 28-day schedule 
Or should you delay dose two? Should you lower dose two, have dose two? Should you omit dose two? And, which path, and either way, you're going to get COVID-19 COVID down the road. Which path has less myocarditis? And we have a paper in, uh, I think, um, the Journal of Medical Ethics where we model this, and we show that it's like five-fold higher from getting all the boosters on scheduled time than it is if you just took the risk after dose one to get the virus. So put another way, I think one can prove that particularly for men between the ages of 16 and 24, that the risk of additional doses of the vaccine have higher rates of hospitalization for any reason than the risk of the virus going forward. Why public health has no shredded its trust. I think we gotta get into it. The masking literature. When Fauci went on 60 Minutes in March 8th, 2020, he was asked point blank, should you wear a mask? He says, no, you might touch your face and have compensatory behavior and it might not work. And he said that because the Cochrane Review of that year, 2020, says, it's medical or surgical mask in the community prevention said, seven studies took place in the community and two in healthcare workers. Compared with wearing no mask, wearing a mask makes little to no difference in how many people caught flu-like illness. Nine studies, 3,000 people, probably makes no difference in how many people have flu confirmed by laboratory tests. And even in healthcare workers, in the four studies that were conducted in healthcare workers, N95 probably makes little to no difference in how many people have confirmed flu, flu when compared against surgical masks. And that's been vi validated in the annals. Meanwhile, what was the rhetoric? This is in the Atlantic magazine, the real reason to wear a mask by Tufekci and colleagues. Quote, research shows that even a cotton mask dramatically reduces the number of viral particles as much as 99%. They also add, models show that if 80% of people wear cloth masks that are 60% effective, easily achievable with cloth, we can get an effective r naught of less than one. That's enough to have the spread of the disease. This was completely wrong. It was entirely fabricated. They were wrong when they said it, and they've been proven to be wrong on that. This is Tufeki writing, quote, the topic of children's transmission is unsettled, but I think kids K through 12 can mask up, and it's okay if younger ones do it imperfectly. And this country's CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that kids as young as 25 months wear a cloth mask for prolonged daycare periods, except for when they nap side by side in the same room for hour after hour. It's a big kind of exception to the cloth mask rule. So we wrote about this in Slate. We call it the noble lies of COVID-19. And I think the noble lie is that we really didn't have great evidence to recommend it initially. And I actually don't disagree with the recommendation without good evidence. I think you can do it. But the problem is when you do it, you need to also have better evidence while you're doing it. So why could not the United States run a cluster randomized trial of community masking? We didn't run it in kids. We didn't run it in adults. We didn't run surgical versus cloth versus N95. We ran zero studies of community masking in this country in the entire pandemic. How can we do that when the available evidence was so uncertain, when it was so divisive, and continue to implement it? I think that to me is why trust has plummeted. Here's what I say about research on masking kids. I mean, I wrote this paper in 2021. It created a lot of consternation. But I said the biggest failure when it comes to masking, particularly kids as young as two, is that we simply don't have any data that's pertinent to that age group. It was a missed opportunity, I think, for randomized trials. They were massively divisive in the US. We ran to zero studies. And I actually think the real answer might not be all or nothing. I wrote in this paper that it might depend on the type of mask the age of the child and executive function, indoor versus outdoor masking, actually Palo Alto mandated outdoor masking for kids on playgrounds, rates of SARS-CoV-2 in the community, it might have an interaction, the duration of time indoors, and that might actually be paradoxical because the longer you spend in the same room, the, it might be less likely to work, it might work better for shorter periods, and cohorting might impact it. So I talked about this this morning, I wanna talk about this study that people cite because I think it's got one of the biggest problems of concealment bias. I don't think anyone here except for Jay heard that. Was anyone here for my concealment bias thing at one o'clock in the morning? Oh, it's a couple people. Okay, I'll do it again. So this is the paper that appeared in Science Magazine by Jason Ablock and colleagues. And it was one of three attempts to do randomized trials of, cloth, of, of masking. And this was run in Bangladesh. And it, there's a few things notable about it. They take 300 villages in rural Bangladesh. When the study starts, the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 was zero. They essentially, nobody had COVID-19 at baseline. The 300 villages were matched based on population. So they were roughly comparable in size. And then they applied cluster randomization. They randomized the villages to villages in which we would go, give masks, recommend masking, and villages in which would be control villages, we'd go, collect information, but not recommend masking, not give out masks. 
That was the study design, a cluster randomized trial. It has the beauty in it, which is that it measures not only whether or not my mask protects me, it measures my, whether or not my mask protects you, because the whole village is a unit of randomization, and we measure any and all cases in the village. Okay. The study has four endpoints of the study. Okay. Those endpoints are symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. What do I mean by that? It's actually something called symptomatic seroprevalence. In other words, we accrue hundreds of thousands of people. I'm going to show you it's about 178, 160,000 people in these two arms. And those people agree to participate in the study. Half of them are going to get the masks and be told to mask, and the other half are not. And then anytime somebody feels scratchy throat or sick or ill, you're asked to give us a call. Let us know you feel sick. We're going to document that you feel sick as endpoint number four, respiratory infection prevalence. That's just self-reported symptoms. If you feel sick, this is the fourth endpoint. We're going to mail you a kit. The kit is a puncture of blood. We're going to take the blood back to Yale. They don't use swabs, and they don't do PCR. They needed something that you can do a little bit later, like what if you couldn't get the swab to them right away? So they use a blood kit to measure antibody against COVID-19. So in other words, it's symptom-driven, zero prevalence. That's the primary endpoint of the study. The secondary endpoint of the study is the endpoint I thought is the best endpoint. They go randomly to 25,000 people in these villages, and they randomly collect zero prevalence at the end of the study to see asymptomatic, symptomatic, did we slow the spread of COVID-19 from community cloth masking? The third endpoint is obviously an intermediary endpoint. It's just you sent observers to the village to see how often they wore masks. This is from clinicaltrials.gov. Here's the big result of the paper. In, com in control villages, Three quarters of 1% of people had COVID-19. Symptomatic zero problems, primary endpoint. In the villages assigned to cloth masking, it was essentially the same, p-value 0.54, and this is largely the reason why people say it definitely didn't do anything, okay? In the surgical mask villages, there is a statistically significant p-value of 0.043, and it's an 11% relative risk reduction, okay? This is the basis for why Abeluk thinks it's a great idea, okay? This is a positive study, and science reports it as a positive study. So let me summarize where we are with the four endpoints. The number one endpoint, cloth mask failed. That was actually the predominant mask recommended in this country during, those, during the time the study ran. It resulted in fourth quarter 2020. But surgical mask won. We'll come back to that. This endpoint of randomly reporting seroprevalence, which is the best endpoint because it's absolutely bias resistant, this is not reported to date. They've never reported this endpoint. The third endpoint of wearing masks is an, is an intermediary endpoint. Of course, the group that you give masks to and tell them to wear masks wears masks more than the group that doesn't. I mean, of course, that's true. The last endpoint, whether or not you feel COVID-19 symptoms, I call this useless and subjective because it has to be influenced by the open label design. You know you're wearing a mask. With the same degree of scratchy throat, you might be less likely to phone them up because you wore the mask and you think the mask is protecting you. So to me, the, the better endpoints are the ones that have confirmatory zero prevalence. And the best is random. Okay. That's my thoughts on this. Now let's get to the, the fun stuff. When they published the study, researchers noted that even though they match the villages by size, there's this result in the paper, the number of people who consent to the paper, to consent to the project. When you go to villages where you give out masks, 178,000 people consent. They say, sign me up. I'm willing to you know, take the mask. I'm willing to say, like, if I feel sick, I'll call you. Like, sign me up to this thing, OK? When you go to the control villages that are exactly the same population size, OK, 163,000 people sign up, which is about 15,000 less. OK, a few less. OK, maybe is that noise? Is that real? I don't know. It's a little less. If you look at the number of people who symptomatic blood samples tested, it's about the same in the two arms. It's kind of interesting. Maybe that's because it works, right? But this imbalance is interesting. There's, they're matched on size, and you get an imbalance of 15,000, which is like a 9% imbalance. All right. Here's what these, this is the analysis by Ben Recht and colleagues. I actually think it's very clever. So I'm going to walk you through what they do here. So what they're doing on this figure, can you see my mouse? OK. What they're doing here is they're running a simulation where they sample from a null distribution. In other words, they're saying, what if, what if we just took this, what if we just uh, assumed that there's no, there's no difference between these two arms, and we sampled from the same distribution twice many, many, many times. This is basically like you know, creating the p-value. And what they show you is, in most analyses, if masks do nothing, most of the sampling, most of the simulations would find no difference. 
That makes sense. And if masks do nothing, only rarely would you find a difference like the one seen, which is shown in the red line, the actual observed effect in the study. And so what you see here is that this is a significant result, OK? And you know, it's not way out here. It's not like super unlikely to occur by chance, but it is significant. If you look at the rate of symptoms, this is symptomatic seroprevalence. That's the primary endpoint. This is the fourth endpoint, symptoms. It's a little bit more significant, OK? It's more significant. If you look at the consenting population size, there is a difference, and it is extremely significant. It is p-value with four zeros, five zeros in it. In other words, way more people in the villages that got masks signed up to this study, way more people, and that is the most significant difference in the entire study, that way more people signed up. So my question to you is, why? Why did way more people sign up? And here's the answer, concealment bias. In randomized control trials, we talk so much about blinding. And blinding means that the patient and the doctor, often, that's double blind, they don't know what they're getting. The patient doesn't know if it's placebo or drug, the doctor doesn't know, that's double blinding. We don't talk about concealment. Concealment means at the moment of randomization, do you not know what you're gonna get? And concealment is different than blinding during the course of the study, it's at the moment of randomization. In the modern era of clinical trial accrual, when you randomize somebody to a cancer drug, you call a phone number and it gives you, it randomly generates a number and tells you which arm they're gonna be in, for instance. You know, it'll tell you which label, it'll give them a number and tell you which packet to give them. So we use computer generated randomization that cannot be gained, it's concealed. Like, I don't know what they're gonna get when I call. In the old days of cancer trials, we used to give investigator a deck of envelopes. Each envelope was in order and told you placebo, treatment, placebo, treatment. But the problem with that method is that if I'm doing a breast cancer study of a really new drug, and I think the drug is really promising, and there's a 70-year-old woman who comes in, you know, I'm willing to pull the envelope, but what if there's a 40-year-old woman who comes in with three young children? You know, do I really want her to get placebo? So you know what I might do? I might hold that envelope up to the light and just peek, and if it's placebo, I might just go to the next envelope. And in fact, this happened. I mean, this is, this, is what, this is why they call it concealment bias, that they knew what they were doing sometimes, and so you can detect that. Okay. In the world of modern randomization, you almost never see concealment bias, but I'm very confident that what happened in this study is they didn't conceal randomization. That's why so many more people signed up to masks, and here's how. When, you go, when they actually conduct this study and you go to the control villages, they pull up in a Toyota Yaris, small car, they get out, clipboard, you want to sign up, and 163,000 people say, yeah, I'm happy to contribute to science, sign me up, if I feel sick, I'll send my blood in. If you go to the treatment village, they pull up in a truck with boxes in the back, and then they say, hey, you want to sign up and control, contribute to knowledge and blah, 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 running a study? And people see the boxes in the back, and they say, you know what? 178,000 people sign up. Let me put it another way. For every 10 people that sign up in the control arm, there's an 11th person that signs up in the arm that's getting the mask. Why does that 11th person sign up? They sign up only because they have a feeling they're gonna get something that they, that's for free, okay? So the whole randomized study hinges on the fact that that 11th person is no different than the first 10 people. That that 11th person, the kind of person who wouldn't contribute to knowledge for knowledge's sake, but they would if you see a box in the back of the truck and you think you're gonna get something. That person has to have the equal propensity to pick up the phone and call when they feel sick and the equal propensity to report their symptom and the equal propensity to send their blood. And I would offer that we don't know that to be true. And if I were to bet, I bet they're less likely to pick up the phone and call. So I actually bet the only reason this trial is positive is that it's not a perfect randomized study. It's a study of 10 people versus 11 people. And the 11th person behaves very differently. And if they behave ever so slightly differently, and don't call that phone ever so slightly less, you will explain all the findings of this study, that there'd be a small difference in symptomatic seroprevalence. All right, so that's why I think that study is actually does not prove mask work. It actually, if anything, really undermines their case. All right, I'm gonna pause and stop. It's too much talking. Um, what can I say? The CDC still recommends masking kids as young as two. This is our article in Pediatric Respiratory Disease. I think that's a problem. All right, I'm happy to stop and take questions on any topic, but let me give you the last slide of the deck. I think communicating science is in crisis. I think many, many issues that 25 years ago would not be politicized are becoming politicized. 
And I worry that we may soon enter a world where every single scientific issue is politicized. I think Paxlovid is politicized. I think, what if we lived in a world where every drug is politicized? That scares me. I think all we can do as scientists is our best to pursue the truth as doggedly as possible, to understand and aspire for unyielding honesty, to have more debates and to engage with people who may disagree with us, and to question the things that people are telling us. And I think science was once described as organized skepticism. And I urge you all not to be cynical, but to be skeptical. And so when you hear a claim, you need to interrogate it. That Bangladesh study looked good to me, but the moment I saw that analysis of dif different consenting population, it didn't look as good to me anymore. And I think we have to interrogate everything we believe with that sort of fervor. And that's the only way to regain trust from the public, is to be un flinchingly honest, not to tell them things that we don't know to be true, not to say that cloth masks will reduce the R naught, they didn't know that to be true. And I think we have to run a lot more studies, and the more studies the better. Okay, I'm happy to take questions on any topic. Thank you so much.